Make sure you stay to the end of this video, because this case is probably the most controversial story I've ever covered on this channel. On Friday the 5th of January, just over two weeks ago, a 20-year-old woman named Michaela Green was standing on the porch outside of her apartment while she was speaking to her mother on the phone, when she would suddenly realise that her younger brother had accidentally locked her out. Michaela's mother, named Monique Tyler, then attempted to call her son, who was just getting in the shower, but by the time he got to the door, she had mysteriously disappeared. According to her brother, the only evidence left behind was Michaela's cell phone, so the family assumed that she had just gone for a walk and would be back soon, but when Monique returned around two hours later, she was mortified to see that the front door was unlocked and the cell phone was still outside. An official missing person report was then quickly filed with the Houston Police Department, and officers were sent out to the residents to speak to any potential witnesses. Neighbours reported seeing the young woman walking along Southway Drive, but unfortunately, they were unsure which direction she was heading in, and therefore, without any real leads to go off, the police were still no closer to finding the missing 20-year-old woman. So, with the concerning details that surrounded her disappearance, many were starting to wonder if Michaela would ever be found, and more hauntingly, questioned whether or not she could have been Houston's next victim of human trafficking. However, 15 days after her disappearance, a call would come in that would change everything, as Michaela Green was finally found and brought home to her mother, leading to celebrations throughout the community. But despite this incredibly happy ending, many are still sceptical about the story and its validity especially her own father, Chris Green, who had some very choice words to say about Monique in a Facebook Live post that would spark a debate within the community as to what actually happened here. Michaela Green was born in 2003 to her mother and father, Monique Tyler and Chris Green, in the city of St. Louis in Missouri. From a young age, Michaela was always considered an incredibly sweet girl with a shy personality, spending most of her time with her family who she cared deeply about. Not too much has been unanimously confirmed about her younger years, but from what I was able to gather, as Michaela moved into adolescence, her strong interest for Asian culture started to emerge, with the young woman choosing to spend most of her waking hours watching anime and following the lives of Korean pop idols. However, it would seem that at some point during her childhood, she would move away from her hometown of St. Louis when her mother decided to settle in the city of Houston in Texas, where she would eventually be enrolled at Spring Woods High School. It is unknown how she adapted to her new life in Houston, but there were clearly some issues going on in the background, as she would eventually decide to run away from home in 2021, where she was eventually found by police in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. To this day, Michaela has never explained why she left or what happened to her during this time, but either way, this event would appear to be the catalyst for what would be a very tumultuous three years, where she would briefly live with her father, only to return to her mother a year later. But eventually, given her unstable upbringing, alongside her apparent mental struggles, all of these issues would ultimately build up to that fateful day in December of last year when Michaela would seem to disappear without a trace. On Friday the 5th of January, the 20-year-old woman was on the phone with her mother, Monique, when she decided to step outside onto the porch to continue their conversation. By all accounts, it would seem that the pair were having an argument over the phone about house rules, and Michaela was visibly upset. However, Partway through their conversation, the young woman suddenly realised that the front door was now locked, as she couldn't get back inside. News reports and statements from the family are conflicting, but from what I was able to gather, it would seem that Michaela had her cell phone and a set of keys on her, but the house had been double locked from the inside, so she was unfortunately stranded in the cold. Her mother, Monique, then offered to call Michaela's brother as he was supposed to be at home and luckily he picked up whilst in the shower. He then agreed to go downstairs and let her in once he was finished, but by the time he got to the door, Michaela had disappeared and had left her cell phone behind 
as well as her keys, according to some statements. At first, the confused family just assumed that she had simply wandered off to cool down after her argument with her mother and frustration with being locked outside. But when Monique returned home after around two hours, she was devastated to see that the cell phone was still sitting on the porch, untouched, meaning Michaela had not returned home like they had expected. So, severely concerned by the dangerous situation, Monique felt that she had no other option than to call the Houston Police Department to report her 20-year-old daughter as missing. On Saturday the 6th of January, Michaela's panic-stricken family began searching all over southeast Houston to see if they could find her as soon as possible. Her mother, Monique Tyler, was wandering along the streets, handing out flyers and knocking on doors, but unfortunately, she claimed that a lot of people were ignoring her due to their likely criminal affiliation, so she would have no luck on the first day. Monique would then go on to spend large sums of money that she didn't have on gas to travel around Houston looking for her daughter, but it seemed no matter how hard she looked, no leads would ever seem to emerge. She even detailed that on one morning at 6am, she checked the local park for any evidence that Michaela could have left behind. But once again, her efforts would come up empty, as it appeared that Michaela had simply vanished into thin air. Security cameras were also coming up short, with the police being unable to find any evidence of which direction Michaela had walked in after leaving the home. In fact, the police were even unable to find out if she had walked off or was picked up by somebody in a car driving by. And so, at this point in the investigation, it seemed that anything was still possible, leaving Monique severely worried for her daughter's safety. It was then that Monique decided to take the case to the media and started posting Facebook Live videos to her profile, detailing the case and her efforts in finding Michaela. Many locals chipped in to help with donations and shared the story across their own social media platforms to help raise awareness. But despite the efforts of everybody involved, sightings of Michaela continued to evade the police. However, just when Monique felt that the case was starting to reach a dead end, she received a call from a local news team in Houston who offered to pick up her story and share it around the world. So, at this point, it seemed like the case was about to take a positive turn. On Monday the 15th of January, multiple news networks broadcasted the tragic story and even interviewed Monique for her take on the situation. In the video, you can visibly see the despair in her eyes as she explains the case and details the concerning conclusions that could potentially happen if Michaela isn't found, including human trafficking as a harrowing example. So, with the new revival in the case, Monique started to receive help from across the country, with people promising to look out for her daughter and offering any help they could. But despite this new glimmer of hope, as the days would go by, the police would still struggle to find any leads and unfortunately had to deliver this bad news to Michaela's parents. The local community were heartbroken and Michaela's family were growing more and more concerned with each day that passed. However, just as the case seemed to be heading in the worst possible direction, with no sightings of the young woman for over two weeks, Monique Tyler would suddenly receive a phone call from her friend over in Northwest Houston with an announcement that would change everything. On Friday the 19th of January, a woman named Lisa was working at her nail salon when she would unexpectedly notice a young girl walk into the store with black circles around her eyes. She immediately recognised the girl as Michaela Green, and thinking fast, knowing her mother Monique, Lisa pulled the girl aside and offered to give her a manicure in order to buy her mother some time to drive over to the salon. She then called Monique and told her she had her daughter in her store and that she was safe, and in response, the worried mother raced into her car and headed straight over to the salon, and even opened up Facebook Live to document the whole process. Monique then eventually arrived at the salon, where she greeted her daughter with open arms and expressed how happy she was to finally see her after 15 days of being missing. The two then exchanged words while Michaela finished off her manicure, and during the conversation, Monique would try to get some answers out of her 20-year-old daughter, but given the traumatic event that had just occurred, 
Michaela was understandably quiet on the situation, so not wanting to put any unnecessary pressure on her daughter, Monique opted to stay silent on the issue until Michaela said she was ready to speak. Eventually, the two then headed home together in the car and got straight back on Facebook to deliver the good news to a community that was so elated to know she was alive and safe. However, despite this seemingly happy ending to such a potentially devastating story, many skeptics were quick to question the story's validity, which was of course met with fury and disapproval from Monique, who was just grateful to have her daughter home and didn't appreciate the negative comments. So, to this day, all we know about the case is that Michaela is home and no longer missing, which can only be seen as a good thing. But with so many people questioning the contradicting statements and irregular details that existed within the case, the question that still remains is what if Michaela Green was never actually missing in the first place? Now, just before I get into the theory portion of this video, let me just say that I have absolutely no conclusive evidence of anything here, and I am merely attempting to draw attention to a case I feel has not yet received enough investigation by giving my opinions on the matter to hopefully spur on some further examination and protection of this vulnerable young woman. Now don't get me wrong, I was so relieved to hear that Michaela was found safe and alive. I was actually writing this very script and researching the seemingly tragic story when I suddenly saw her mother on a Facebook Live video sitting with her daughter with smiles on their faces. But the more I watched, the more I got confused. Firstly, I was still unsure what had actually happened and how Michaela had been found. It was clear that she had wandered into a nail salon and asked to go home, but I didn't understand why Lisa felt she needed to keep Michaela distracted with a manicure while her mother drove over. If she wanted to go home as she claimed, surely she didn't need a distraction. Also, where actually was Michaela all of this time? There was mention from Monique that her daughter had been spending the whole 15 days with a friend in northwest Houston and had been using substances, but this seemed like such a strange explanation, as Michaela, a 20-year-old woman who was always glued to her cell phone, didn't want to take her phone with her for some reason. How could she have forgotten such an important thing? Also, why did she randomly wander off that day in the first place? There were so many unanswered questions that puzzled me. But to be fair, Monique explained that she had tried to get answers from Michaela, but she'd refused to speak on the matter. And being a concerned parent, she didn't want to push her daughter too far in case she would shut down completely. So I was reasonably satisfied with this explanation and started to move on, just grateful that Michaela was alive and well. But something kept nagging at me. I had previously watched a Facebook Live post by Michaela's father named Chris Green, and he had gone into specific detail about Michaela's very tumultuous upbringing by her mother Monique Tyler that certainly made me start to question the details of the story before I even found out Michaela had been found. After all, the news reports were so conflicting, and even Monique herself, when trying to raise awareness for her missing daughter, gave several different accounts of the events that took place that day. For example, the news reports said that Michaela had gone missing while Monique was out running errands, but other news reports said that Michaela had actually stormed off after getting into an argument with her mother. Now, it's possible that these stories could overlap, as maybe the argument was happening over the phone. But even if this was the case, why did Michaela storm out of the house, only to want to return right after? But let's say I'm just getting confused, and there is actually a perfectly good explanation for these conflicting stories, and I'm just being ignorant. But even so, there are still some major red flags in my opinion, that I will attempt to uncover in the rest of this video. So before I go into more detail around why I feel there may be some lies and deception involved in this case, let me first set the scene for you by summarising the story told by Chris Green himself on that Facebook Live post about Michaela's upbringing and why there are certainly some question marks around her mother, Monique Tyler. So, starting with her childhood, Michaela was born in St. Louis, Missouri to her father Chris Green and mother Monique Tyler and shortly after being born, they decided to get married. However, after a year or so, Monique started cheating on Chris with a local man who apparently had 20 children, 
and she would eventually fall pregnant to this man's 21st child. However, in an attempt to save her relationship with Chris, she decided to get an abortion. However, despite making promises to Chris that she would change, it soon became apparent that she was once again sleeping with this other man. And so, once Chris found out that she had been continuously lying to him, he decided to kick her out of the house. But unfortunately, as Monique was Michaela's mother, she ended up gaining custody and eventually moved across the country to Las Vegas, along with her four-year-old son named Alex, who was from a completely different father. While she was over there, she had another child with a new man named Rob. But after six months of this child being born, Monique made the incredibly poor decision to leave her children alone in the apartment and was therefore taken to court. Chris then drove 1.6 thousand miles from St. Louis to Las Vegas to go to the hearing and potentially regain custody of his daughter. But as he was late, he was not granted custody and instead, Michaela was briefly put into foster care at the age of two until later that year when she was surprisingly given back to her mother. However, unsurprisingly, it didn't take long before it was discovered that Monique had once again left her daughter alone in the house, when a maintenance man heard a young child crying through the door, and this would understandably result in Michaela being sent back into foster care, all within the same year. Keep in mind, however, at the time, Monique had been failing multiple drug tests and even tried to blame her own mother when they caught her with illegal substances in her hair. But despite the ever-increasing list of red flags, the courts still decided to give Michaela back to her. But this story is only scratching the surface, as during the trial, her ex-boyfriend and the father of her first-born son, Alex, was also invited to the hearing, and as he was on time and had a stable home life, he thankfully gained custody of his child, and they returned to St. Louis together. However, in another twist to this never-ending story, Monique would then travel over to St. Louis herself, and while Alex was playing outside, she snatched him and fled back to Las Vegas. But anyway, getting back to Michaela, it would seem that as the years went by, she was yearning for her father and would always ask her family why he wasn't in her life. But unfortunately, she was constantly lied to by Monique, who claimed that Chris wasn't interested in her and didn't want to be in her life. But luckily, as Michaela started to move into adolescence, she created her own Facebook account, and one of the first things she did was search for her absent father. Eventually, she would build up the courage to message Chris, who was overjoyed to be able to speak to his daughter for the first time in years. And during these conversations, he made it clear to Michaela that it was not his choice to be out of her life, and that her mother Monique was the person behind their separation. Well, Michaela was understandably left confused and unsure who to believe, but as she was stuck in Las Vegas, it didn't matter, as she was miles away from her father and was trapped in a neglectful home with her mother. However, she would get a stroke of luck when Monique would decide to move back east, eventually settling in Houston, Texas, in order to be closer to her own family. And soon after they arrived, it wasn't long before her father Chris would make the easier drive of 700 miles to see his daughter face to face for the first time in years. By all accounts, they had a heartfelt emotional reunion, and Chris left the residence feeling blessed to have been able to spend some real time with his daughter after almost 16 years of being apart. However, although things had improved with the relationship between Michaela and her father, the relationship between her mother was only getting worse, with the two constantly getting into heated arguments, some of which turned violent. And as Michaela moved into her late teenage years, their relationship would continue to degrade, and eventually a severely brutal fight would break out between the two women, leaving Michaela so upset that she decided to run away from home, and ended up over 260 miles away in Baton Rouge, Louisiana before being found by the local police and returned home safe. Monique then called Chris to tell him about the situation and ordered him to come and get his daughter, as she was fearing for her life given Michaela's apparent violent outbursts and difficult behaviour. So, with a mindset mixed with concern and excitement, Chris headed back over to Houston where he would collect his daughter and bring her home to St. Louis, where she belonged. From here, Michaela's behavioural issues really started to improve, as she slowly became acclimated with the other side of her family. 
Chris would regularly spend time with Michaela alongside his own family, including his mother, brothers and sisters, and friends. And by all accounts, everybody loved her, and quickly her sweet personality started to emerge as she grew in confidence and became more comfortable. So it certainly seemed that for the first time in Michaela's life, she was finally living in a stable home that was filled with love and attention. However, things weren't perfect as there were apparently times where Chris would catch his daughter talking to herself in her room, where she would be speaking negatively about her mother and getting herself worked up. She would also refuse to speak to her father about the time she ran away to Baton Rouge, and whenever he would ask, she would make up a story that never seemed to stay consistent, leading Chris to hypothesize that she may have gone through something dangerous. But despite these moments of darkness, she really was becoming a happier person, and it was clear to see by the whole family that Michaela was happy living with her father, and that she had made the right choice moving in with him. Now, I wish I could just end the story here, because regardless of what you choose to believe, it's clear to me that Michaela clearly had an incredibly difficult childhood, and desperately needed a steady home to give her life some structure. So this move back to St. Louis to be with her father should have been the beginning of her road to recovery. But unfortunately, as you already know, our story doesn't end here, as after a year living with Chris Green, Michaela would once again move back in with her mother. Now before I explain why she decided to move back to Houston, I feel it's important to mention that by this time, it was very evident Michaela was suffering with some serious psychological issues, and was actually taking medication to sedate her and to prevent any mental episodes from occurring. In fact, it was strongly believed by her father that she was most likely suffering from Asperger's syndrome, as her behaviour was showing clear signs of autism. She reacted strangely to her emotions, she would smile when she was sad, she would say strange things from time to time that didn't make any sense. But alongside these traits, she was also incredibly gifted at school and even got accepted into college a few months before her graduation, despite her struggling social skills. However, even with all of the positive ways in which she was improving during her time with her father, this didn't mean that she was always happy. As time would go on, Michaela would start to speak about her mother, and Chris picked up on this immediately and worried she may have been missing her. For a while after moving in with her father, Michaela refused to admit that Monique was her real mother, but after almost a year had passed, it seemed that the tide was finally turning and Chris felt like she needed her mother back in her life. So against his better judgement, he decided to call Monique and asked her if she would like to speak to her daughter, but to his shock, Monique explained that she was actually visiting St. Louis at the time, and would be more than happy to drive over to say hello in person. Well as you can imagine, Chris was furious at first. After all, how could Monique have driven all the way out to St. Louis from Houston, Texas, and not even bothered to try and get in touch with Michaela herself? But swallowing his pride, Chris didn't let his anger get the better of him, and allowed Monique to come over to reunite with her daughter. Well, soon enough, she arrived at the house, and Michaela couldn't contain her excitement as Monique entered through the door. The pair then spent hours speaking in the living room, as they caught up and reminisced about the old days. Apparently, Monique's brother had unfortunately lost his life during the COVID pandemic, and so there was a moment where the mother and daughter would embrace over the loss of a close family member. After this, Monique then asked Chris if it was okay if the two of them went to visit Michaela's grandmother, who lived in St. Louis, and given that his daughter seemed happy and excited to go, he allowed them to leave together, with the promise that she would be returned later that day. Now despite what you may assume, the day was actually a success, and Michaela was eventually dropped off by her mother, explaining how she had a really fun time. However, it would seem that this day would be the catalyst for what was about to come, as the improvements Michaela had made over the past year would soon start to unravel, with the young woman delving deeper into her behaviour issues once again. It was like she had become a different person. She was short-tempered, quick to frustration, and started to show mild signs of violence for the first time since she left Houston. Chris could tell something had changed within his daughter, but given that she was supposed to be going off to college soon, he figured it wouldn't be long before she would be away from her family once again, and would therefore be given some much needed space. However, 
This day would unfortunately never come, as the 18-year-old woman would shockingly decide to call the police on her own father under the claims that she was in fear for her life. It was a Saturday in the year 2021, when Chris Green would suddenly hear a phone ringing coming from downstairs. He walked out of his bedroom wondering where the sound was coming from, and quickly realised it was a Facebook call notification sound. The ringing then abruptly stopped, and Chris called out to Michaela to see if she knew whose phone was being called. But to his surprise, he was met with a screaming teenager who was clearly not very happy being interrupted. The reasoning soon became obvious, however, as Chris noticed that Michaela was on the phone with her grandmother and was, by nature, a lot more on edge than usual. An argument then broke out between the father and daughter, with Michaela raising her voice to the point of screaming, as Chris attempted to explain himself and calm her down. But the shouting didn't stop, and so eventually, with Chris rightfully refusing to allow this kind of behaviour, he shouted back at Michaela and ordered her to give him the phone and to go to her room. A tussle then broke out between the two, with Michaela shrieking to the point where neighbours would have likely been able to hear. All the while, the grandmother was still on the phone, listening to the whole thing. But sooner or later, Chris was able to grab the phone out of his daughter's hand, and then he sent her to her room to call off. He then sat with his brother, who was present for the entire situation, and decompressed after such a stressful event. But just as he started to relax, he heard Michaela's bedroom door open, and then saw her run down the stairs and out of the house. At first, he just assumed she was going to blow off some steam after their argument, but concerned for her safety, he got up and looked out the window to see where she was heading off to. But as his eyes scanned the neighbourhood, he noticed the blue flashing lights of the local St. Louis Police Department, and as you can imagine, his heart sank. It turned out that Michaela had somehow gained access to a phone in her bedroom and called 911 to report that her life was in danger. The police were understandably concerned, but after talking with Chris and noticing Michaela's distressing behaviour, it was clear that she was more than likely suffering from some kind of mental episode, as opposed to being the victim of any kind of assault. The officers then asked Chris if there was anywhere she could stay for the time being while she called off and given that he had family in the area, he called his sister to see if she would be willing to look after Michaela for the weekend. But unfortunately, she was out of town, so the next best option was her grandmother who lived nearby, and given that the two had recently seen each other and enjoyed their time together, Michaela agreed, and so the police dropped her off at her grandmother's house shortly after. However, history would soon repeat itself, as during the time at her grandmother's house, Monique Tyler would take this opportunity to drive back up to St. Louis all the way from Houston, where she would pick up her daughter and take her back, while Chris was eagerly awaiting her return. So, by the time Monday rolled around, the concerned father would receive a call from her school, asking where she was, and this was when he realised that for the second time in his life, his daughter had been taken away. Now, the rest of Chris Green's story is impossible to explain, as by this time, Michaela was living in Houston, and therefore, he had no idea how she was living or what was happening in her life. However, one last piece of information that he provided was that Monique had apparently taken her daughter out of school just four weeks before she was set to graduate, and just two weeks before her end-of-year prom. Chris mentioned that his son had even agreed to take Michaela to her prom, as she didn't have a date at the time. So this was supposed to be a beautiful moment for the family, that seemed to be stripped away by Monique in her quest for child custody. I have no idea if Michaela did graduate in the end, or if she even went to college, but given that she was living at home with her mother at the age of 20, I would imagine that she didn't. Now just before I continue on with this story, I feel it should be mentioned that all of this is just what I was able to ascertain from Chris Green's Facebook Live post, so we have to take all information with a pinch of salt. He claims that Monique is a serial liar and has always been a cheater, but if you look at his rap sheet, he isn't much better. For example, Monique would later express in a retaliation video that Chris was actually a scam artist who was in and out of prison his whole life. Apparently, this was why he was unable to be in Michaela's life all those years, 
not because she was being hidden from him like he said. According to Monique, the reason he never gained custody was because he was either in prison or the idea of giving a child to an ex-felon was far worse than giving her back to a drug-addicted mother. So, it would seem that neither parent was perfect. However, I will say, when confronted with these claims of being a bad mother, rather than disputing them as you would expect, Monique instead explained that these events happened 20 years ago and were therefore irrelevant, and even went as far as to blame Chris for using his daughter's missing person case as a means of getting revenge on his ex-wife. But whoever you choose to believe, it would appear that either way, Michaela had a very difficult upbringing and given that she spent 20 years living primarily with her troubled mother, this would lead me to think that at least some of these mental issues Michaela faces surely have to be down to the way she was raised. A key example I would like to touch on is her first disappearance which occurred back in 2020 or 2021, when Michaela was just 17 years old, where she ran off to Baton Rouge in the neighbouring state of Louisiana, which is a story we still don't have the answers for to this day. So firstly, why did she run off in the first place? Was it because of her mental illness? Was she afraid of her mother? Was she in search of money or independence? These are unfortunately questions we cannot answer, as Michaela has refused to speak on the matter, at least according to her father. But regardless of any explanation, you can't deny that for a young girl to travel all the way to Baton Rouge from Houston, Texas is no easy feat, and therefore she would have likely needed help to get there. Could she have hitched a ride with a trucker? Or maybe talked somebody into lending her some cash to take the train or a bus? Or maybe she could have even been given a ride by a friend? Her mother, Monique, always claims that Michaela is a homebody that rarely goes out and keeps to herself. But if this is the case, how would she have friends that would be willing to drive her all the way to Baton Rouge for free? In my opinion, nothing good can come out of this story, and if true, there is very little chance that she made this trip unscathed like her mother claims. Also, the fact that she refuses to speak on the situation tells me that she may have been traumatised by whatever it was she did during this time. So perhaps rather than glossing over it as if it was just a small event that is now in the past, we should be looking into this pattern of destructive behaviour with Michaela running away from home and putting herself in dangerous situations multiple times now. But before I get back to discussing why Michaela may have felt the need to run away, I would first like to speak for a moment on a similar case that involves another young woman that ran away to Baton Rouge and how her story had a much darker ending. The missing person case of DeAndrea Ford burst onto the scene towards the end of last year when it became known to the public that this 21-year-old mother had gone missing after being involved in a murder trial and was set to be a witness in the coming weeks. It was discussed by many that she may have been taken as a means of silencing her and preventing her from testifying, but just a few weeks ago, it was announced that she had actually been murdered by a local man after they found bloodstains in his van. Now this story is clearly tragic and if you would like more information, I highly suggest checking out the video on screen now as I go into a lot more detail about the case. But taking a step back, and why I believe this case relates to Michaela Green, is that DeAndrea was also a young black woman from Houston, Texas, who ran away from home to Baton Rouge, and during this time, she had been a dancer and an escort as a means of earning money for her family. It was during this time that she was involved in a murder as she sat in the back of her manager's car and watched him be shot to death. Luckily, she survived the incident, but given that she was the only living witness, her life was understandably in danger. Now, obviously, this portion of the story isn't too relevant to Michaela, but what is relevant, in my opinion, is that this story may be able to shine a light on what goes on in Baton Rouge and why young women of colour seek it out as a place of opportunity. Perhaps Michaela heard stories of women being able to make a lot of money in Baton Rouge as dancers and made the decision to head out there herself. But after arriving and taking an immediate dislike to the lifestyle, she allowed herself to be found by the police who then took her home. You can probably imagine the horrors she would have gone through, so I'm not surprised she has kept quiet about it going forward. But my point is, this experience could have caused some deep-rooted trauma for the young woman 
and I fear that if she doesn't get some professional help, it might only be a matter of time before she runs off again. Because who knows, if she doesn't talk about her story and doesn't get the help she obviously needs, she may end up just like DeAndrea Ford, which is a conclusion I sincerely pray never happens again. In addition, it would seem that after Michaela returned home, according to her father Chris, she was having some serious mental health issues, and she would get into extremely heated arguments with her mother, one time even brandishing a weapon to threaten Monique. At one point, Michaela even ended up in the hospital and was apparently going through a mental episode, as she was screaming down the phone claiming that Monique wasn't her real mother, and that there was a woman on the news looking for her. In my opinion, it almost sounds like a psychotic break, and during this mental episode, she was living a fantasy where her seemingly abusive, narcissistic mother was not actually related to her, so maybe she was experiencing some kind of delusion that she actually belonged to another woman, as her way of trying to escape from her hellish reality. Now, maybe that's a stretch, but either way, you can't deny that this kind of behaviour is certainly not something that should be taken lightly. But for some reason, despite living with her father for a year, she was still allowed to live with her neglectful mother who likely went straight back to treating her poorly again. But before I go any deeper with this theory, I must remind you all that the information I am detailing here has primarily been gathered by the words of her vengeful father, so we need to keep in mind that there may be a few details that have been exaggerated or blown out of proportion. But either way, removing the 20 years before Michaela's disappearance and focusing mainly on her recent case, what actually happened to her this time around? And could her mother Monique have actually just made the whole thing up? Well, many would argue that this whole story could have been nothing more than a desperate ploy for attention and money, as Monique has certainly been lapping up the spotlight ever since her daughter went missing, and been happily accepting any donations from the community. One particular moment I would like to personally point out is that when Monique first heard the news of her daughter's discovery, rather than heading right over there and finding her as quickly as possible, she somehow felt it was appropriate to get her phone out and set up a Facebook Live while she drove over to the location. You could argue that she wanted to keep her followers in the loop, but if it were my child, the only thing on my mind after being without them for 15 days would be to get there as soon as possible and find them, not get my phone out and record myself. From my point of view, this decision plays right into Chris Green's harsh opinions about Monique as an attention seeker and a liar. Also, once she's with her daughter in the nail salon, Monique then asks Michaela if she knew she had been on the news and saw the missing person reports, and in response, Michaela clearly utters the words, When I called, it didn't answer. You've been on the news for two weeks! What are you talking about? Which is met by her seemingly furious mother who quickly moves on and doesn't revisit the statement. Monique was also very quick to defuse any comments about the confusing nature of the narrative by saying she didn't want to push her daughter for answers and didn't even take her to the hospital for treatment. Now although you can explain away the first part, I can think of no decent explanation as to why a concerned mother would not take her daughter for at least a checkup after she had been missing for 15 days without her phone. Now there's so much more to say, so if you are interested in this story, I implore you to check out the Facebook Live posts made by Monique and her ex-husband Chris, as there is honestly so much information and I would like for you to make your own assumptions before just taking my word for it. Anyway, before I get too lost in the rabbit hole of this case, I think it would be for the best that I end this video here. But if you have any opinions of your own that you'd like to discuss, please leave your comments below and I will do my best to get back to you. But until then, thank you so much for watching, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any case updates. Also, if you found this video interesting, make sure to check out the playlist on screen now, where I've covered a range of similar cases including DeAndrea Ford as well as a number of others that are unfortunately still ongoing.